So when I was in the fourth grade, the world's greatest scientific achievement was made. It was like 1991, 92, any guesses? That's right, Gushers fruit snacks were created. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. I ate the same foods my parents ate growing up. We milked our own cows, we raised our own chickens, collected our own eggs, grew all of our own fruits and vegetables. Everything was self-sustaining on our farm. So when I saw Gushers and this super cool commercial where they were like this regular fruit snack but filled with goo, I, I had to have them. I just wanted to eat something that had a TV commercial. I mean, to me, my whole life, food, food was just work. It was work. It was, it was pulling weeds. It was picking stones all summer. It, friends, do you want to come over and play? No, no, we're picking stones all day. No. Um, it was just work. It was milking cows. When I got off the bus from school, there was always some homemade baked good waiting for me. And I wanted something exotic. I wanted like a Twinkie, something with a wrapper, you know? But, but that wasn't in the cards for me. And, and I ended up resenting it. I, I hated it. I, I wanted to live where there were sidewalks. I wanted to go through a grocery store and buy more than just sugar, salt, and flour. I, I wanted to live like everybody else was living. Um, so in the fourth grade, when I took my homemade meatloaf sandwich and I traded it straight up for a tiny pack of Gushers fruit snacks, I really believed I got the better end of that deal. <laughs> Still do, almost. Um, eventually, I grew up and lived out my dream to an extent. I moved to California. I made TV commercials for a living. Um, and I worked in television and I started grocery shopping with everybody else. I was walking through the grocery aisles, picking out what I wanted, buying a steak in a package. Um, it was all new to me. Uh, <laughs> and then that's when I realized I was an idiot. Um, you see, I grew up with the best of the best food. The, I mean, I, I grew up in a world, and now live again in a world where when you go out for a steak, it's more about the drink that comes before the steak than the steak, because the best steak is the one I make for myself. Um, some of you are nodding, you agree. My steaks are delicious. Um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> but uh, I guess the struggle for me was I thought that there was something wrong with me. I was buying food from a grocery store. I was following our family recipes the exact same way uh, my mom taught us, all of us kids, to cook them. Uh, and then. I, I, was, I ended up with a hot sauce addiction because I needed to make this food taste like something, like anything. I knew I was following the recipes, I just chalked it up to maybe I was a bad cook. I'd roll home for the holidays, uh, we'll fly home for the holidays, and um, then I was like, no, it's not me. I'm not losing my sense of taste. The, the food back home still tasted like the food from home. So I found myself, uh, when I would travel back home, I would mail myself uh, my, my, my clothes, and I would fill my luggage with frozen beef. That's true, that is absolutely true. I would take cases of meat, I would take my mom's dilly beans for Bloody Marys. I would, it would all be coming back on a plane with me because I cared more about that than my underwear. So I became slightly obsessed with everything. Life happens, and, and I found myself doing the unthinkable. I moved back to that farm that was nothing but work, that place I resented growing up, the place I spent years going to school to try to flee. Um, I went back, and I enrolled in culinary school, actually here in town, uh, because I, I could not figure out why this food from the stores wasn't tasting like anything, and it bothered me. Um, so in culinary school, you're surrounded with other like-minded, food-obsessed people. You would all cook a few dishes, and you would spend time dissecting every aspect of everyone's dish. Um, it got a little annoying. I mean, there are some really annoying foodie people out there. Um, <laughs> but what I found is that I was tasting things and discovering things in food that other people weren't tasting. I could taste how long that pork chop they were serving me had been in a freezer. 
I could taste how old those cherry tomatoes were on that salad. Um, what I did then was I took this test and found out that I have this polymorphism in a gene um, that is responsible for receiving bitter flavor compounds. Uh, one in four people actually in this room likely have the same thing. You're categorized, um, I hate the term, but you're categorized as a super taster. 50% um, of people are average tasters, 25% of people are non-tasters. But if you are the sort of person, if you enjoy salt, if bitter foods, like if you gotta give yourself a little bit of a pep talk to eat a grapefruit or a Brussels sprout, um, if smells bother you more than anyone else, um, you're probably a super taster. And you can probably hone that skill a little bit better than even you realize. Uh, so by the time culinary school was wrapping up, I was growing and still am these beautiful heirloom tomatoes. I was discovering that I could taste the difference between every variety of tomato. And the weird thing was is I realized when I was picking through a, a patch of strawberries that in the morning, I could taste a difference between a strawberry picked right after sunrise and a strawberry picked right after noon. And I thought I was a freak. <laughs> I mean, I love beer, clearly. I love <laughs> microbreweries. Uh, but I cannot, for the life of me, drink an IPA. It's just too bitter. So it's not all fun and games. There are, there are some landmines built in. <laughs> but I, I did become obsessed, and I, and I wanted to figure out why. So to figure out why, I had to go way back. I had to look through old family recipes and old recipes in general. I started collecting old cookbooks. And I realized, first and foremost, the chickens we were growing 100 years ago are nothing like the chickens we're growing today. When they were talking about a recipe, they were talking about a two to three pound bird put into a pot and cooked a very long time because chicken was always tough. So then I had to figure out, well, how were they growing chickens? In 1920, it took roughly four months to grow a three-pound chicken. Um, it's, it's changed quite a bit, and the reason is because of World War II. During World War II, all of our beef started getting sent overseas. All of our red meat went to support the troops. So we were left in this country with chicken, and before World War II, chicken was kind of a... Mm, a luxury food item. Uh, if not luxury, it was, you'd raise them on your farms, you'd sell them to the people in town because they didn't know any better. It was, you know, they paid good money because they took a long time to get a little bit of meat. So in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the USDA got together and they launched the Chicken of Tomorrow contest. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, and during this contest, what they were able to do, they were focusing on yield. They needed to make chicken cheaper so that when all these soldiers came back, it became a good option for them. So they did. They managed to create a chicken that in roughly six weeks was three and a half pounds. So, I mean, that's an incredible feat that they were able to redesign this bird so fast. Um, I have a great example of this. This year specifically, uh, Myself and my dad grew two different types of chickens. These birds were hatched on the exact same day. This was what we call harvest day uh, for, for the Cornish cross bird, which is the white chicken you see there. Um, the other bird in this picture is a breed that was popular around 1920. It was known as the Winnebago. It originated in Amro, Wisconsin. It was renamed in the middle of this century the Golden Lace Wyandotte, but in reality, it's not a Wyandotte chicken at all. It was renamed just for branding purposes. So, damn it, I call it the Winnebago. Um, <laughs> but these chickens were born the exact same day. They were fed the exact same ration. They lived in the exact same chicken coop. They had the same access to the same feed, the same water. Their lives were identical. And you can see just from breeding alone, this is the difference in the, in the, in the size of the bird. This is breeding, uh, our average chickens this year at six weeks old were seven and eight pounds. Um, you can see how efficient that is and why chicken now is so cheap. It's so cheap, in fact, that in 1960, we spent on average 18% of our take-home pay on food. 
Today, we spend less than 10% of our take-home pay on food. Food is cheaper now than it has ever been for people. And, and it's not just about the chicken itself and redesigning, it's how we have to cook them. We can't follow that same recipe. We're eating a young chick now. We're eating something that is essentially a six-week-old tiny baby that was designed to grow really, really fast. I'm not passing any judgment on that. You guys are able to eat a really cheap chicken nugget. Good for you. Um, but my point about that is, is that we are growing a lot of things a lot faster than we used to. Uh, the speed was essential. We had to grow things for greater yield, greater shelf life, disease resistance, and the one thing that we were able to give up was flavor. And we were able to give up flavor because in 1955, this cool little contraption called the, the gas chromatograph was invented. And what that allowed us to do was isolate specific flavor compounds in food. So, so what you have now is the red delicious apple. We all know it as being red and not delicious. But it is, <laughs> right, I mean, it is mostly used and always has been for juice in this country. Uh, after 1955, we were able to add natural flavoring uh, back into that juice. So the apple doesn't have to be a great apple. We can make it taste like whatever we want. There is a reason not a single person in this room has ever been able to only eat one Dorito. I mean, really, it is the food, it, it's not designed in a lab, but the flavor profiles are isolated to make you crave more. So, uh, we also on our farm raise beef. And our beef are raised outside with their moms. We try to do it as close to natural as you can. Uh, they live a life uh, drinking milk from their mother months longer. I mean, it's comical. You drive by our farm and there are these full-grown cattle drinking from their mothers still. It's absurd. But, um, but they live a very good life because at, at two years old is when beef are harvested in this country. We believe that they have to be harvested that, at that age because it's the only way to get a tender steak and it's the only way to have enough fat in your steak. So um, essentially what is happening in the world, though, is not following what's happening here. I'm traveling to Spain in March and I'm going to eat a steak from a 17-year-old oxen. And it's believed to be the best steak in the world. It turns everything we know about food and flavor on its head. And there are people like me who are traveling across the world just to try it for one meal. Um, I'm also raising pigs right now. I'm raising a breed of pig called the American Mulefoot. It's the most endangered breed of hog in the country. And it is endangered because it's a fatty pig. It's got fat in its meat, and its meat is red. Over the years, we were led to believe that fat is bad. In reality, fat is flavor. So as we bred flat fat out of our meat, we also lost flavor. So now what is pork to most of you other than a vessel for some sort of sauce? I mean, how, how many people love the taste of just pork? Not many. We're um, also looking into, as a farmer, soil. Soil in general is something we're still trying to figure out the relationship between, we know that in a teaspoon of dirt, there is over a billion microorganisms, a billion. And we don't fully understand how they interact with our food, how they make some of our food sweeter. Uh, but we're learning. And farmers, farmers of animals, are taking a bricks measurement of their forage that their animals are eating. And that is most commonly used in winemaking. Uh, specifically, it measures the amount of sugar in grapes. Um, but farmers are using it to see how many available nutrients are in their pastures, and in turn, showing them what their animals and their animal products are going to taste like. It lets them know how good their cheese is going to be by how good their grass is. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's a few things we can all do to just be better. Uh, we can start growing our own food. Just it doesn't. You don't have to dig up you know, your driveway and plant a big garden. Just, I mean, a, a pot of parsley by a kitchen window will change how you see all food. When you put in the work, the work that I hated as a kid, when you start putting in the work, you see all food differently. You're not, 
you're not going to let a plate be scraped into a garbage can. You're going to eat it all, and you're not going to take that huge portion to begin with. We waste way too much food in this country, and it's because we are disconnected from the people growing our food. Grow a little bit yourself, you're going to waste less. Uh, pay more for better quality from local farmers. It costs more when you know the person who's growing your food because there are no middlemen. It's going directly into their pocket. But let's be real, most farmers are doing whatever they can in the commercial environment that they can scrape a living out of. If you talk to a farmer, if you know a farmer, if you meet one, they're happy to grow an animal or a vegetable or a fruit the way you want it to be grown. They're happy to do it. You just got to show them it's worthwhile. A farm is not a zoo. A farm is not a garden. A farm has to make money for it to exist. So you have to put the money there. Eat what's in season. You've all made a damn fruit salad for Christmas. <laughs> I know it. And you've all been disappointed. Every single one of you have been disappointed. If you, if you make food for people when it's in season, you will fool them into thinking you're actually a good cook. Because when it's in season, it has all the flavor it needs. You can do less to it. You don't have to screw with something that's already great. So I, I know it's hard, but honestly, you're better off buying canned pineapple in the middle of January than buying a fresh pineapple that was just flown halfway across the planet to get to your table. It's just going to taste better. Um, and lastly, raise your standards. I mean, so many of you think you know what good food is, but trust me, I've walked through your grocery stores. It's awful. <laughs> it's like the dial was turned down to four. I mean, when you can grow something for yourself, when you can find someone to grow it for you, it's like it's cranked on up to 11, and life is too short not to love every bite. Thank you. <laughs>